um, guides and palm cards that we distribute. So I had to distribute, I had to hire and train and distribute forms to, I believe it was 56 precincts across the state of Montana. So I did that. And then I, he asked me to oversee the C3 program. So the non-political program, um, just get out the vote work in um, Fort Peck. And I was like, where's Fort Peck? I'm a West sider. I'm not a East sider. So I'd never been to Fort Peck. I'm just from from my res and that's where I, I was just content, you know, being on that side. And, and um, but then I went out there and um, we recruited 18 people from across the state. We rented vehicles and we went out to Fort Peck to rock the, the native vote out there. Um, so that's how I got here. And then um, I stuck around because I like the the unity, the community and the victory that we've seen that year. Um, so um, I uh, the 2013 legislative session come up next and we are fighting for Medicaid expansion that year in our state. And unfortunately it didn't pass, but the experience that I went through with my nine-year-old daughter um, sparked something inside of me. Um, she was uh, wrote her own testimony with the words misspelled and everything phonetically as a three-year-old would do. Um, and as we were standing in line to testify in front of, I believe it was the Health and Human Services Committee, mostly all uh, older, all older white men, um, it was a little scary. Um, there was a lot of fear inside of me and I was a, in my late 30s. And I thought about the courage that this little girl had as she would say, Mom, I'm scared. Mom, I don't want to do this. And I just kept encouraging her to do that. And I, through that time, I thought, what would where would I be if I would have had that opportunity to have my voice heard and feel the courage to overcome some fear that I was going through that was completely outside of my my comfort zone? Um, and so it was that, and I was also doing some personal um, growth, uh, you know, efforts as well. And so those things coupled together just sparked something inside of me to want to create that opportunity for all Indigenous little girls, um, you know, of course, uh, from Montana, because that's where I'm, I'm from, and that's what I call home, but I'd like to see that everywhere around the world that our Indigenous girls grow up with a strong voice, and that they believe in their voice. And so I also grew up thinking um, that my voice didn't matter and my vote didn't count. Um, but through that experience and my personal journey, I now believe that my voice does matter very much and my vote does count. Um, so if you haven't voted yet, we have seven days. Get out and vote and figure out a way to get yourself there. There's a lot of organizations out there that are uh, helping people get pick up ballots and deliver them to the election office. So I just have to make that little plug. Remember to vote. Um, so it's through this organization that I've learned, you know, how to speak up. I also grew up in a family where I was told uh, to be seen. I am to be seen and not to be heard. So I also had some of that lingering in the back of my mind and still do to this day, but I fight it off. And that's what I, I my passion is working with Indigenous girls to help them um, realize their own um, right, their own passage, their own um, voice and the power of it. And hopefully they can speak up. And so the organizations, uh, Western Native Voice and Montana Native Vote were formed in 2011. And Western Native Voice um, was uh, had a board of directors of all women on whose shoulders I stand today and all the other people who have done this great work. Um, Gail Small, um, Norma Bigsby, uh, Carol Juno, Rhonda Whiting, um, and Jennifer Perez-Cole are some of the members from both of our boards. Um, and so they've done a lot of work through decades to make sure that uh, Natives have a, a access to the ballot. Um, you know, we as Native Americans, we were the first ones here and we we're the last ones to become citizens. We didn't come uh, become citizens until 1924. We had World War II veterans retur returning home from serving in active duty and they were not able to vote. Um, that is one story I heard early on and that has just stuck with me and it, it, it continues to inspire and spark me, uh, spark, light that spark inside of me when I'm feeling tired and times are tough like they are right now. I think about our ancestors and the resilience that they um you know, carried within them to, to, for me to be here where I am today. Um, and then, um, so yeah, we're, and then we didn't get the right to vote till 1965 uh, with the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, we're still fighting for that right to vote right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see, you guys hear about all the voter suppression activities, mostly the news covers what's going on down South. It's the same stuff right here in our own backyard in Montana. We natives are fighting for that access to vote. Um, access to election services, to all of that stuff. So we're, we, it, it's, we need to stand together. Um, allies need to stand with us to ensure that election services are in our communities. 
um, because we are really um, disenfranchised and it's not an equal playing field for us now when it comes to uh, election services, especially when you think about COVID times and, you know, people staying at home and the shelter in place orders. So, um, you know, that's a little bit about the organization and myself. Um, our organization is based in Billings. We work on the seven tribal nations um, and Billings, Missoula, and Great Falls. And currently we have somebody in Helena and in Butte um, doing get out the vote activities. So with that, um, I will turn it over to DeShane. Well, and so uh, my area of focus, you know, for the last 25 years has been Indian health and health care in and policy are you know, linked uh, intricately. And in starting uh, in this field, you know, um, I had mentors who, I'll be honest, going into the healthcare field, I never thought I was going to have to understand how Congress works. I never thought I was going to have to understand how a bill becomes law, how elections work, you know, um, the electoral college, all of that. And in reality, that has been probably one of the most uh, essential components of the work um, that we do because policy makers create policy that impacts our lives, um, directly impacts our lives. And, you know, what we see is that policy makers are you know historically not representative of the communities you know that that we come from, um, whether you know reservation based or, or urban native communities, um, and so their perspective does not carry that cultural component um, that is really necessary to make well informed decisions about what policies should look like for our people um, and our community. So the work that, that we've done in the past has very much, um, you know, started, it started as, you know, we have to teach policymakers to better understand our community and understand our needs. Um, and we undervalued our role in the system. Um, you know, if you look nationally, the native vote is absolutely an undervalued resource. Um, we look uh, two examples that I want to share with us here today of the power of native vote. One Democrat, one Republican, uh, and, including our own John Tester here in Montana. When he won in 2006 his Senate seat, he won by 3,562 votes. That year, more than 17,000 votes were cast on Montana's Indian reservations, and that's not even including the urban Indian population. And so the, the weight that we brought to that election had a direct impact. The same can be said in 2010, and by that time, I was already in DC working at the National Council of Urban Indian Health. US Senator Lisa Murkowski became only the second person ever to win a US Senate seat through a write-in campaign. And she will be the first to admit that American Indians in Alaska were a huge component to the success for her uh, election um, through a write-in campaign. And especially with the last name Murkowski. Like we, I still remember all of the, the work that went into teaching native voters, Alaskan native voters, how to spell Murkowski because it had to be spelled correctly. And, and it was so effective that she was actually able to win her Senate seat and, and do that through partnering with American Indian uh, communities. And so we, as, as native people, we are just coming into this idea that we don't have to just try to inform policy that we can lead policy, that policy makers are accountable to us. And now we're moving into this new generation that I'm so excited to see where the policy makers are from our community and they are native. You know, when you look at the fact that, you know, nationally, so you, if you look at, you know, sort of the census data and look at the fact that we're traditionally undercounted anyway. So if you, 
put the you know American Indian Alaska Native alone, it's not even in combination, is two percent about of the um, national population. That means that two senators should be native. That means that you know a dozen representatives should be native, and we don't see that. The, their, their, the representation has not come from our community in the past and that's changing. Um, and I love that that's changing. And that is also a result of native vote. The idea that natives uh, can vote for other natives is empowering. And we see this happening in both parties. This is not partisan. We have natives who are you know, stepping into leadership roles in the Republican party and natives who are stepping into leadership roles in the Democratic party and you know the the other um, parties out there. I know we call ourselves a two party system, but you know there are other parties out there. And you know n natives and especially our native women have really been leaders in getting us uh, moving us from the invisible to the visible. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. We're definitely not there yet, especially nationally. Um, you know even. It was a little disappointing, um, but at um, Joe Biden's town hall, um, it, it, when he was mentioning um, all of the different communities, he did not mention Native American. Um, I think that, you know, he would be the first to say that he's remiss in that and that, you know, he does want to work with our, our population, but we're still an afterthought. And by keeping us as an afterthought, I mean, what I will say is this. Um, when that beast awakes, there's gonna be some real reckoning. American Indians are a, a powerful voice within this nation, even if we have not wielded that power to its full capacity yet. Um, and, and that's you know the work that myself, Marcy and, and other native leaders are doing is getting us to the point where we can wield that voice strongly. Um, yeah, Marcy, what, what have I missed? Um, a lot because we only have 30 minutes, but I think we're both doing a good job on, on, um, talking about that. And I just will reinforce that, um, the policy is why these organizations exist that I work for is to, to have an influence of policy. Um, what our role in, in, um, influencing policy is we, uh, brief COVID times, we brought folks to Helena to testify. We provide trainings, our organization provides trainings on how to testify, how to dress, how to address the committee, um, you know, and just help calming people's nerves and reassuring them that they can do that, provide talking points if we can get it. We have a lot of allies that work on different issues. So if a member calls us and says, I wanna go testify on this uh, particular bill, and maybe Western Native Voices isn't working on it. We'll um, provide a scholarship to get them there and connect them with allies um, to help them find the information that they want to uh, share with the committee. Um, so we we do a lot of that. And I will just share like in 2013, when I first went there with my daughter, there was about five of us natives. Fast forward to 2019, um, there was events there where there was like 50-ish uh, natives there. And so it just shows the progress um, and the the movement that is happening in our communities. Um, so it reinforces what Deshane said that we are going to, um, you know, when we unite as one, as a native voice on the issues that we all agree on, we're, we're going to be powerful. I see it taking place in small doses around the nation. Um, Cause you know, we, in our organizations, we work with um, um, organizations in other states. Some um, are like ours and some are a little different, but nonetheless, you know, we all agree on tribal sovereignty, right? We all agree on access to healthcare, access to the basic needs. Um, it just, there's differences in between the two political parties, but I believe we can work together um, to address these common needs, um, you know? And I think, you know, it's just standing up and, and having our voice heard and, and doing it together. I'm really a firm believer in what Deshane said about doing it um, together. Um, and that's one of our goals as with our organizations, we've helped start an organization in North Dakota, and then we have a project going in Idaho right now with the get out the vote and get out the count work. Um, so very important work being done by our organizations. And there's um, a few funders out there who support the and really strongly encourage the collaboration. Deshane and I both receive funding from um, this one funder who just really pushes us to collaborate as Native uh, communities 
And I think it's nice to have an outsider. Um, uh, it's nice. It's it's productive to have an outsider, um, you know, pushing us to collaborate because um, historically uh, you don't see a ton of collaboration with all the native programs and efforts that are going on. Even on my own tribal nation, there's different efforts happening on suicide prevention and language prevention, and there's not a lot of partnership or even communicating with each other. So I think coming from a native perspective. Um, I think that's something that we as natives are working on. How do we come together and how do we support each other? Um, but I, I've seen a lot of progress and I've only been around the civic engagement arena for eight years. So, um, but I have seen a lot of growth in this short eight years and we, you know, talking about funding too, what is it less than, uh, is it, gosh, I can't remember the number. I haven't had to talk to people in so long, but it's like less than 1%. I think it's less than point something of 1% of uh, philanthropic philanthropic funding comes to Native issues. So we get such a small piece of the pie when it comes to funding. Yet look at the work we're doing. We're building momentums and collab momentum and collaboration and network. Um, you know, there's like the NDN Collective, there's Native Voice Network, NCAI. There's a lot of groups that are going to get um, working together, um, you know, to, to um, for us, our biggest issue is voting rights. Because uh, if we can't put those decision makers and policy makers in place, um, then, you know, we kind of lose that seat at the table. When, um, you know, so they, I, I, this is my first time doing the Zoom webinar, so I'm still learning the format a little bit. So I think there's chats and questions, but um, one of the things that I saw roll through mm -hmm. was um, what would help rec recruit more native candidates to run for office. And I do want to get to that, but I also want to get to also the question of what would help more natives vote and, and participate. And I think that, you know, Marcy mentioned the issue about, you know, natives not become, you know, we were the last to become citizens. We were the last to have, you know, everybody thinks of America as sort of, you know, the land of the free and there's this bill of rights. We have freedom of religion. Well, natives didn't. American Indian religion was against the law until 1978. When I was born, our religion was still against the law. And so, you know, I think natives historically have, we're, we're used to not having rights and not having the same rights. So what that has created is an intergenerational uh, communication that, you know, we don't fight for our rights. Um, and so, what we see is natives turned away from the polls uh, at disproportionately high numbers. And a, I, I wanna say that they're allowing themselves to be turned away from the polls because they haven't been told that, it, that they can fight for that right. Um, and so what we really wanna see is native voter education. And like Marcy said, you know, the funding is, is really, you know, abysmal when it comes to um, getting resources and, and tools out to communities to teach young natives about their right to vote. And here in urban areas, what we see is that a lot of times tribal IDs are not accepted even though they should be. Even though by law they are valid identification, um, <clears throat> what we see is a lot of places will turn people away. And so what someone you know starts to think is, oh, if all I have is my tribal ID, then I can't go vote because that's not a real ID. And, and we need to work within our community to reverse that trend so that no, we have the right to vote. We have the right to use tribal IDs as identification. Um, and we have a right to participate actively in this political arena. Um, sorry, so. Yeah, I'm going to hop in real quick here. We do have some questions coming up in the chat. Our Q&A doesn't seem to be working, folks. So if you do have a question, get it in the chat and we will get those answered. I was figuring let you all run for another five minutes or so with some background and history and what you wanted to get out there. And then we would jump into some of the questions that are popping up here. I think we, I don't know, Deshane, should we jump into answering questions? Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, that sounds great. Let's get started on some of these that are coming up. We've had both in the chat and some uh, beforehand. So here's one from Marcy. A question about redistricting. 
Given the history of the redistricting lawsuit that created the legal requirement to draw district lines that had the capacity to elect native representation, what role are you taking with the current Montana Redistricting Commission to make sure that we have strong districts that can elect native legislatures? So thank you for that uh, question, Senator Sands. Um, <laughs> We, so we started off uh, focusing on that with get out the count efforts. So to try and get as many folks counted as we could, we started that back in July of 20, uh, 2019, educating people on the importance of the census and, on, and then on how to get counted. And then as you all know, that was all uh, went to heck on how our efforts were to do that in our communities. Um, and through that, we have stayed in touch with the um, redistricting, redistricting commission um, you know, on different um, strategies and what's going on as far as the census and how that's going to impact us. And so we will be doing a call to action to have people submit um, requests on how the boundaries should be redrawn or if they shouldn't. As you know, there's a lot of people out there who want to suppress the native vote and um, they are requesting, I mean, their efforts will be trying to um, move those boundaries so that we no longer have a native uh, dense uh, house district or senate districts up, mostly up on the high line those are the ones that are in jeopardy um, so we will be very involved in a lot of call to action so all of you who are out there contact um, western native voice not until after elections um, and then we will share with you maybe some strategies that we think would be helpful in doing um, uh, a push and reaching out to the redistricting commission to let them know that there are a lot of Montanans out there who do want to see uh, our native voice maintained in Helena because it is a powerful, powerful um, group of folks. And um, I see um, Senator Weber is also on here. Thank you for your service. All of you legislators, thank you for your service. I, I admire and, and, and respect and, and appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marcy. And this one for DeShane from Senator Sands. Montana has the highest number of native legislatures from both reservations and urban areas. What would help to recruit, recruit more native candidates to run for office? When that, I mean, so I was kind of hinting at that in that, and I understand how frustrating this can be, but so I'll, I'll, give the example from healthcare. One of the issues in, in Indian health historically has been that there were not, the providers who were coming in were not native because we didn't have native MDs, native PAs, um, native MPs. And so what, what was happening was um, people who are not native were coming in and, and serving in this role as, as caregiver. And the, the answer to that was to really grow the workforce development. And that is the same, that the answer is the same for growing our, um, you know, our representative uh, uh, legislators is that, you know, that, that needs to be done through a process where we actually intentionally work with, from a young age with Native youth and teach them about the, the policy process, the, you know, um, all, all of the, the skills and resources and tools that are probably almost just intrinsically happening, especially in the mainstream, you know, white community, you know, where, where kids might be, are, are taught from a younger age, you know, well, this is how you advocate for yourself. This is how you, you know, ask about policies. This is how you do that. Where native youth aren't taught that. Um, and, and by starting that process, yeah, so we're talking, you know, a multi-generational approach. That's not the short term. That's a, that's a, that's a long-term fix to the, the problem. Um, but I, I think that any short-term fix is going to be more sort of addressing symptoms and not addressing the problem. And, and the, the real problem is the inequities that exist um, between the two communities. And you know, we, what we also see is that when you have a community that's disenfranchised, it's harder to participate. Um, you know, when you have communities that are dealing with intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, you know, uh, high rates of, you know, um, substance abuse. And, and I mean, I, I don't like talking about that because people who aren't familiar with the, the topic, then 
co-opt it and say, oh, you know, all natives have substance use problems, which is not true. Natives are actually highly resilient people um, and our communities are highly resilient, but we're still dealing with a lot of um, historical and intergenerational trauma. And that puts us behind when it comes to the race to participate in, you know, civic in engagement and civic life. Um, and so addressing those inequalities is what's actually going to be the answer for parity uh, in, in the, you know, civic process. Great, thank you. And that maybe leads into this question we have here. Um, you've kind of answered it in a way, but maybe we can broaden it out with Marcy's input too. Can you give examples of how a person's health, physical, mental, or spiritual impacts their level of engagement within their community and how we, how we can find ways to improve upon that? Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a loaded question. And when, um, when I was told that Shane would be the one who I would be presenting with, I, I shared my goal or my vision or my thought of, this is more than voting to us. This is about a change of lifestyle. This is changing the way we think. This is, this is you know, it's not just checking a box for us. It's a change of the way we live. And it's, it's healing from a lot of, you know, in order to be um, civically engaged and civically responsible, we have to be more um, um, grounded spiritually, culturally, um, you know, mentally, physically. And when I, I will say, we've had some discussions in my circles about what does culturally mean. I don't mean that you have to practice in your traditional native ceremonies. That's not what I mean at all. I mean, your culture is your culture, whatever you identify as and whatever you have as the culture of your home, even that's your culture. Um, so there's been some, I just had to clear that up in case any of the folks who've been in those conversations with me are on this call too. Um, so talking about that, just really grounded in healing. And I, um, after taking this job and being in this organization, I, I have a phrase, an old phrase that I've heard a lot of my life really, really um, had a new meaning and new interpretation. So I think a lot of you have heard the, the saying, I'm so broke, I can't even pay attention. And through this work, when I've thought about why are people not voting, why didn't I vote in my first, you know, several years of my adult life and did a lot of thinking and had a lot of conversations with folks. And we're, some of us were, and I was one of those that was literally too broke. I could not pay attention to policy. I could not pay attention to voting. I had to think about where my next meal was coming from. I suffered uh, an addiction. Um, and so I literally was too broke. And I'm not necessarily financially broke, but emotionally broke, spiritually broke. So I really like, I mean, you could write, write a book on, on that adage or that saying of I'm too broke. I can't, I'm so broke, I can't even pay attention. So it really gave a new meaning to that to me. And that's where I had something in my head turn. And this, this has to be about a community healing, a community um, intersectionality of what do we all agree on? I mean, that's something I've put my, my heart and soul into in this organization and in my conversations with people, um, natives and, and allies is it's got to be a healing and you can't come and, and, and think that we're going to just step into your, your lane and play your game. Um, this election system is made by the dominant culture. It's not made to include us Native Americans or Black folks or other people of minorities. It's made to exclude us and it's made to work for the very wealthy. We see that happening right now in our elections, right, in our, our elected positions. And so we as... Um, oppressed people as minorities, we have to come together. Uh, right here in Montana, it's us Native Americans who are the majority of the minority. We have to come together and we have to find ways um, to heal. And, you know, a part of that, what I've been doing in, on my own, uh, with my own relationships living here in Billings, um, a lot of non-Natives want are, um, you know, they don't know a lot of um, who we are, where we come from. And so I've shared a lot of my own stories and my own journey coming from the reservation. I grew up a, a res rat and I'm raising my kids as urban rats. And so it's a whole different um, way of life living here in an urban area. Um, there's a lot to sacrifice. I've given up my um, ceremonies, at least as regular as I'd like to have them. I've given up my family. I've given up my homeland. I've given up a lot to come out here and um, and live and work out here in, in the urban areas here in Billings. 
Um, so I think it's so it's, I, uh, it's, I'd love to hear Shane's, um, excuse me, Duchesne's comment on that, because it's really about healing um, and about addressing the whole self. And I see a lot of native vote programs. That's how we are. We, we center on the whole individual, the whole community. I, when I first came into this work, I seen a lot of non-native organizations, uh, mostly white, of course, in, in Montana, that are just going through knocking doors, you know, talking to 25 people within an hour, knocking 25 doors or something, and having these conversations just to get their IDs, to put them on a, a database somewhere so they know. That's not the way Western Native Voice has ever operated. When I first came in, I say, we can't do that. That's against our culture. We have to sit down and talk to our community members. If they invite us in for coffee, it's disrespectful to refuse. If they invite us in for food, we have to go in and we have to have that food. And that's how we have built the deep relationships for this organization with our communities is we now have trust from our communities. And not every single person, don't get me wrong. There's always, you're never going to please anybody in this world. Um, but that's how we have built that, that organic organizational trust of Western Native Voice, you know, is a good go-to place. We don't know everything. We don't have every answer. Um, we don't involve in everything. We don't get every person and talk to every person. Up till this point, we've been a staff of just three or four people working across the state of Montana and continuing continuing to grow. And much of our staff is like myself. We didn't we didn't grow up in this world in this civic engagement world. Um, many of us are here to um, learn and to help our communities learn along with us. Um, and that's our target: is those people who are new um, and learning. And we like to rely on people like Carol Juno and Susan Weber. And all of you folks that are, um, you know, really experienced to help us uh, continue to expand our work. One well, last, um, you know, building on what Marcy just said, and the the question: civic engagement is a privilege, and it's a privilege that not everybody gets to enjoy. So, if you are somebody who is struggling with a severe chronic health condition, um, if you are somebody who is struggling with a serious mental illness, if you know you are somebody who is coping with extreme poverty, uh, you know, trying to either fight off homelessness or, or work through a situation of homelessness, you do not have the, the same resources and, and and that includes personal resources like energy time you know spirit to be able to uh, effectively participate in civic engagement in the same way that somebody you know who you know has a, a job where they you know are, are making you know six figures and you know live in a, in a neighborhood where they don't have to constantly you know worry about you know crime or violence um, that's just not a comparable situation. And so it's, it's really frustrating, I, I know, to hear this, but focusing just on increasing native vote is really addressing a symptom and not the problem. The problem are the structural inequities that exist that keep natives in that, you know, that situation that Marcy was talking about where they're they're really too broke to to vote, too broke to participate, um, and that's the the issue that really needs to be fixed is those stru structural inequities, um, and, because then what we see is that as native folks uh, have the as that is addressed, you know, as some of the inequalities are you know uh, addressed, and there is a little bit more sort of equalization, then what we see is not just equal rates of participation, but I would say, you know, natives actually actively participate in civic engagement um, because we want to, because we understand, you know, the, the importance that policy plays in our lives. I think, you know, as an as, as a Indian kid, I, I grew up knowing acronyms before I even knew what the word acronym was. I knew what the BIA and IHS were. Like, I know that government impacts my life literally from the day that I was born. Um, and so I think what you see is that native people really do hunger to participate in, in this process, but you know, we're, we're, we're coming at it from uh, you know, where we're starting easily 10 steps back. Great, thank you both for 
that. And looking through, we've got some more comments coming in. Um, one of these, I don't know who it's from. It just says Docs Google. And there's been a couple. Um, how do we help those who are oppressed by their own native people and silenced because they don't fit their agenda associated to the election and their own people glorification? We've been inviting people to come have coffee to hear those native voices that are silenced. Not exactly sure what, can you clarify what you're meaning there, docs.google? Okay, we'll wait a minute for that. Maybe he can clarify that a little. I will also say that the, um, I think it goes back to the healing from my experience in our communities and where we grew up, uh, where I grew up, I should say. Um, lateral oppression and lateral violence is a real thing. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from, uh, it's um, Susan, Representative Weber, or Senator Weber, you could talk more about this than I can. So please forgive me and please step in when I say something incorrect because um, she's more um, versed in this and, and experienced in dealing with this than I am. Um, but I think it's a, it's a healing, you know, it come, it goes back to the, as Shane men, Deshane mentioned that um, historical trauma, that intergenerational trauma that we as natives um, have gone through. And I've been reading Brene Brown. I don't know if any of you have read Brene Brown books. She's amazing. And it talks about that scarcity and that shame, right? Those I think, oh my gosh, I wish Brene could come in and do a study on natives or maybe one of our young people um, who are going into psychology or sociology or social work can do it um, because that I think the shame has a lot to do with how our communities are stuck in that lateral violence, lateral oppression ways. And, you know, I've heard it um, and, and felt it <laughs> as the crab in the bucket effect, um, instead of lifting each other up and, and, you know, providing support for each other to stand on our, our the shoulders, um, that's not happening as much as it could be happening. Um, you know, it, I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, um, because there are people out there who, who do support each other and who are um, moving and growing beyond that. Um, but nonetheless, it's really prevalent in our community. So I think it all goes back to um, self-healing, community healing, and family healing um, so that we can, you know, the scarcity. I really think after um, reading Brene Brown's and hearing her speeches, I think that she knows a lot of stuff. So if you haven't read Brene Brown's books, uh, I wouldn't even know which one to start. Um, the gifts of imperfection is good and parenting. I forget the parenting one, but it really helped me learn a lot about uh, more about us. And um, I talked to my mom a lot about this too. And she talks about, you know, I go to a lot of um, leadership things and try to do my best to be a better person every day. And my mom will always tell me, now, when are you going to come home and learn that from your people? Because that's our traditional ways of knowing. Um, instead of paying somebody $45 or, you know, hundreds of dollars to go learn something from um, these white folks that I learned from, uh, she says, you have that right here in your own home. You need to come back and learn from your own people. And she's right. I do. Um, but it's just, it's not my time right now. I do miss home. Um, but Deshane, I don't know what you have. I know you too, uh, coming from a health perspective, have a lot more to add to that. Well, that's, so, you know, I don't, I don't have a background in, in criminal justice. And I see there's questions here about, you know, the, this issue with incarcerated individuals. And again, I understand that this answer is going to be frustrating, but what I would say is instead of worrying about how, not instead of, <laughs> at the same time as addressing the concern about, you know, the, the, how do we restore the right to vote for incarcerated individuals, the structural inequity of over incarcerating people of color, including natives here in Montana is the real problem that needs to be addressed is that instead of, you know, let's, once they're incarcerated, let's figure out how we can keep them civically engaged in voting. Let's stop incarcerating them in the first place. Um, and, and it's, you know, so even though I understand that this is a webinar about native vote, the fact of the matter is the structural inequalities are what drive the native vote. Um, and so in, it, 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 I'm not saying let's not focus at all on, you know, bringing that to the, the natives who are experiencing incarceration and, you know, uh, uh, encounters with the, the criminal justice system, but let's stop over incarcerating native folks so that that's not such an issue in the first place. 
Thank you. Thank you both for that. And also thank you for kind of tuning into the chat here and trying to answer them as we go. We've got about 14 more minutes. So trying to blend some of these questions is really great. Um, I've got a question here and it's sort of going back and to present. So what is the history of mail-in ballots or all mail voting on reservations? And what do you think about the, that process? So looking at it historically and today, what do you think about mail-in ballots or all mail voting for, on reservations? So I will um, take a stab at that, Deshane, um, and then you can follow up and add your, uh, your knowledge. Um, so mail-in voting obviously is not ideal for our communities. Um, well, before COVID, 70% um, of the voters on our tribal nations uh, and our targeted areas that our organizations works on um, were polling place voters. And so the first time they had been sent a vote by mail ballot was in the primary election. Uh, many of those were rejected because they were undeliverable. Um, maybe if they're lucky, they got a ballot in this general election. So if you are living in uh, a native, um, you know, in one of our tribal nations, and you didn't get a ballot, call your county office and see where it is. Um, because I believe um, some people might have been uh, marked inactive after not returning their ballot in the first, well, not even receiving their ballot in the first, in the primary election. Um, so it's, it's a very complex system. Um, you know, one of it is because of our postal systems, they are limited uh, in their hours of, of serving us. And another one is our addressing systems. We don't have ballots, uh, we don't have mail delivered right outside of our house. Um, on a lot of our tribal nation housing. Um, like I here in Billings, my mailbox is right outside of my door, about 20 feet. Um, in Brackwood and Browning, when I lived in Browning, I'd have to go to the post office to get my mail, to mail anything. And so there's that complex system. And oftentimes a lot of family members share one mailbox. So you don't always get the mail that you um, that is sent to you. Those are some of the problems that we have with mail. And so it's very, um, and there are a lot of efforts across the nation to um, you know, what we're, they're calling it voter modernization, where we're pushing uh, vote by mail, oh, online voter registration, and automatic voter registration. And our organization has pushed back on, on those for here in Montana, because they haven't brought the tribal governments to the table to talk about how does this work with your tribal government? Um, I, we've talked about, um, you know, maybe talking to the enrollment departments and having those signatures on those tribal IDs um, be transferred over because that's from what I understand. I know I might be getting too much into the weeds about it, um, but it's it's collecting those signatures. That's why you can do automatic voter registration, and that only covers people who have a state ID or a Montana driver's license. Um, so it's not ideal for our communities. Um, and I guess we will know in nine days how it um, how we've worked with the vote by mail election because unfortunately we have all, all almost all vote by mail. And most of our counties um, on our tribal nations, and I think most, well, and in most of our counties here in Montana. So I do think um, it's it's not a program that is ready for our communities. Um, we need, if we're going to have vote by mail, we need voting centers on our tribal nations. We need drop boxes in all of the remote places, at least where the polling places were, if not more than that, so that we're reaching all of our communities. <clears throat> I know over in um, Oregon and Washington, when they went to vote by mail elections the talking to the natives over there, the um, return rate, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the turnout rate for natives declined. And now it's like picking up and it's increasing, continuing to increase um, because they like our, <clears throat> our places um, have, you know, embraced it and figured out how to make it work. And voting centers is huge. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a good system overall. Um, I myself, I prefer to vote by mail. Um, because I want to research the candidates. I talk with friends about ballot initiatives, about judges, um, you know, and all those, the different things that are on the ballot. So I myself feel safer voting at home. I remember the one time I did go in and vote in person. I was so nervous. Um, and I don't know if it's just like the environment in there where, you know, everybody's quiet and, and, and whatnot. But since I've started voting at home, I feel more relaxed when I'm filling it out. I can do it with my teenagers and I can do it with my children. Um, and it's kind of a family uh, thing that I do now um, to make sure that my kids are at their young age are learning um, about 
what what does voting mean? And we talk about the candidates and the ballot initiatives with our kids. And um, one of our teenagers is becoming more civically engaged um, as a young person. And just, in, um, you know, she's the one that watches the debates, which I won't even drag myself to do. I won't even watch the debates, but she stays informed and abreast of what people are saying and doing. So as a big picture, it's not a, a we don't want to force our native voters into a vote by mail election. Um, however, I will tell you that when Western Native Voice goes out and registers voters, we do let people know if you check this box right here, you can have a ballot sent to you and vote from home. And so since we've been doing our work, the number of people who are signed up for absentee voting or vote by mail voting has increased. Um, another fun fact is as that number increases, the turnout rate decreases, so inverse. Um, so it's just interesting, you know, how uh, vote by mail is coming in. I think it's like anything new. Um, if we do go that way and, and that change does happen, it will take some work to inform and engage and educate folks on, on um, you know, to remind them to turn their ballot in because a lot of people are used to waiting till election day to go vote. Um, and it's a social hour too for some people. So that's my spiel on vote by mail. It's a hot topic. Well, I, I was just going to say that I think that, that pretty much covered the vote by mail. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay. I haven't seen a bunch. Um, we have a couple more that have come in. One of them is kind of a, more about the present crisis, you can say, that we're in with COVID. Um, how can... What can I do in my community to help get out the native vote during the COVID lockdown? Um, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit first and then let Marcy jump in. Um, I think what is important here is to all of our community members need to have knowledge and, and resources about how to stay safe um, from, from COVID. What we see in Montana is, is that, you know, and I, I apologize, I, I actually haven't checked the numbers in about two weeks. So, and this fluctuates so much, but, you know, about two weeks ago, what we saw was that, you know, even though natives make up just less than 10% of the population, we we're making up 20% of the positive COVID cases and 35% of the COVID deaths. Native people are scared of COVID as well they should be. Um, we are disproportionately impacted by this virus. Um, and so asking a, a Native person to basically jeopardize their life by going you know, out into uh, public during this pandemic is, is I mean, it, 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 it's just inappropriate. Um, now that being said, there are things that we can do. So, you know, for the mail-in ballots, at least, you know, uh, I, I can only talk from my experience here in Missoula, um, you know, the, the elders uh, can fill out their ballots, they can, you know, seal the secrecy, they can put it in the, the envelope, and then a young person can walk it out to the mailbox so that the elder doesn't have to, you know, leave, leave their home um, and, and be exposed potentially um, they don't have to go to the, the post office, et cetera. Um, we can do that for our elders. We can find ways if they do want to, you know, go to the post office themselves and, and bring it, we can help them, you know, with uh, PPE, with masks, with um, hand sanitizer, you know, we can uh, provide them with that safe transportation so that they don't have to get on a public bus right now, which in, in you know, Missoula, um, it, that's a more urban thing than reservation, but you know, our elders are afraid to get on the bus and, and I don't blame them. Um, so there are things that we can do to help increase their participation um, in voting by responding to their need to protect themselves from COVID. Um, and then I think, are we gonna have a chance to sort of do last comments? Yeah, we will. Okay. We're gonna be wrapping up here, probably maybe go five minutes over, but okay. we'll- so I'll, I'll bump over to Marcy and then, cause there's, on a different thing, there's something else I want to talk about, but I'll let Marcy finish this part. Perfect. Yeah, so to ensure that natives are getting voting, you can plug into our organization, Montana Native Vote, and you can um, see if there's a way that you can 
um, engage. I know it's a little late in the game. We only have seven days left, people. I would say do not put your ballot in the mail this late in the game. Find a way to get it delivered. No matter what community you live in, there is a trustworthy, very well-trained and experienced organizer in your community to pick up and convey your ballots. You can also check the status of your ballot if you have um, returned your ballot. Go to My Voter page. Uh, just ask Google or Siri, My Voter page Montana, and it'll pull up a, a little menu and you can type in your name and your birth date. Um, and it'll tell you where your ballot is, if it's been sent to you, if it's been received by the election office, if it's accepted or it's rejected. Um, so um, re use those services in your community if you need to stay home and you can't deliver your ballot. Tell your friends and tell your neighbors. Um, text and call five people and ask them to vote. Ask them if they have delivered their ballot. If they can't, uh, reach out to an organization such as ours. Forward Montana is another one in the Missoula Bozeman area. Um, there's a lot of, not a lot, but there is a handful of organizations who are out there um, picking up ballots. And I will say for our organization, we have very, very strict COVID um, policies and practices in our organization. We have two public health advisors on our staff, or not on our staff, but as contractors um, that have developed uh, COVID uh, safe policies. Um, we have all of the PPE out there. Um, you know, we go above and beyond. In fact, some people won't work with us because of our strict um, guidelines for COVID training. Um, but it's what our bosses want. It's what our board of directors wanted. And I'm thankful that we have people who are looking out for the communities and who realize that this COVID training needs to happen and needs to play, take place. We have mandatory COVID-19 um, meetings every week with the entire staff. And we have over 100 people um, working with us out there collecting ballots. Mm -hmm. I will say the numbers are still very low. I'm very concerned about the turnout rate and our targeted precincts that we work on on tribal nations. So please um, contact somebody, um, text somebody and have them text five people and keep a tree, uh, a tree going. If you're not um, able to deliver or comfortable delivering ballots, call our organization. We have 869-1938 um, is our number and we will dispatch you out to somebody in your tribal nation. We have people across the state uh, in the five cities and in the seven tribal nations. Um, and we'll do what we can to deliver that ballot. And we are trained on COVID. We are trained on the laws um, and our own internal regulations to, to keep track of all of the ballots we pick up and deliver so that there's an accountability on many levels um, from our organization. And then just remember, you can check the status of your um, ballot if you've sent it out um, at my voter page in Montana myvoterpage.com yeah. or something like that. Sorry. I don't know the website in there for so. ask. Yeah, I can put it in um, the chat too. Um, so yes, there's a there's a few ways to plug in in these last seven days and find an organization in your community um, to get a list. You know, we have a list of ballots who um, of voters who have not returned their ballots, and that's what we work off with. We're calling them and texting them and Facebook messaging them, then and trying to get hold of them any way we can, telling grandma to tell grandson or granddaughter, please make sure your grandkids are voting. Um, so it's, it has to be a community effort. And I think the voting, just like anything else, um, that if it's going to work, it, it has to be a community thing. And normally the tribal governments are, you know, on board with us and helping more, but they are so, um, you know, overstressed and, and, and overstretched with the COVID policies that they've not really stepped in with us this time. Um, and they're also doing fighting for work for equal opportunity to voting. I, oh, there was a con uh, question about Ponderay County. So um, NARF and the Blackfeet tribe partnered up and they threatened lawsuit on the election office in, in Ponderay County. So there is a, a, a satellite election office out there. I'm not sure if our local organizer has found somebody out there yet. If you know of anybody who's willing to do get out the vote and pick up ballots in Ponderay County, please let us know or send them our way and we will um, gladly hire them to help with ballot collection up there, um, you know, and there's an issue going on right now in Glacier County with the election administrator not putting up unless she's done it today. Um, but as of yesterday, she hadn't done it as putting up the um, ballot drop boxes in BAB and uh, I believe it was Blackfoot and East Glacier. So there's voter suppression going on right now in this state and it is it is so obvious. Um, you know, it's the lawyers always have to come in and threaten to sue before we get anything done, just like the Ballot Interference Protection Act, right? That was a, a disenfranchisement for Native voters, a lot of Montana voters, but more specifically Native voters because of the remote locations of our, um, our tribal nations and the high unemployment and poverty rates. Thank you. And um, could you let me know what that number was again, Marcy? I'll put that in the chat. 
Sure, 406-869-1938. Okay, so if anyone wants to contact them, it's in the chat, everyone. And to be respectful of everyone's time, we're going to be wrapping up here. So we didn't get to quite all the questions, but I think most of them kind of got answered in one way or another. Thank you all so much. And so I want to let you all have a few more minutes. I know to Shane, you said you wanted to touch on something and then just a final question as we, as we leave today, uh, some uh, a, a inspiration of why, what inspires each of you to vote in just a one sentence um, takeaway and we can leave with a moment of inspiration here. So I'll let you all have your final few minutes to chat and then a one sentence on what inspires you to vote. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. This has been fantastic and we greatly appreciate the attendees and both you, Marcy and DeShane. Thank you. Well, so uh, I just wanna say, cause Marcy started to allude to, to what I really wanna, I know that this is on you know native vote, but I think another issue here is educating non-native voters. There is this stigma and stereotype that as a as a native candidate, you only represent native people, but as a white majority candidate, you can represent everyone in your district. And that's not true. And, and this idea that, you know, as a non-native person, well, I'm not gonna vote for that native person because they're only gonna represent native interests. No, as native people, we are active members of the society and, and we can represent our communities as diverse as they are, whatever they look like, just as well as somebody who is not native. Um, a, a native candidate does not only represent native people. Um, and and that, that sort of education needs to be done for non-native voters. Um, that, you know, th there's this stereotype that not, uh, that, you know, a white person can represent natives, but natives can't represent white people. And that's not true. Um, <laughs> so that's, that was just a, a closing thought that I wanted to end with. And Well, and let's add on to that just a quick, we've got maybe two minutes. That was one of the questions. Many myths about Native Americans have been perpetuated by the dominant Eurocentric culture. How do we dismantle this? How do we break down these perpetuated ideas that have infiltrated the systematic way that people view Native American communities and um, po politics. Just go for it. <laughs> I, I say we give Marcy money. I think that, you know, <laughs> funding, funding efforts like, you know, Western Native Voice, Montana Native Vote, um, you know, to, to do those kinds of educational campaigns, both within the Native community for why we should vote but also within the broader community for the role that, you know, Native people play that, you know, there, there's no resources there, or at least they're under-resourced uh, to do that kind of education. And, you know, change is not going to happen without education. And so let's fund that proactive education. Awesome. I would just like to add that, and for the Natives out there, um, that are listening and tuning in. Um, I once heard uh, when I graduated from the University of Montana, uh, Dr. Vernon Grant had said, if we want the history to be told accurately, we have to start writing the books, us natives. And so if you're native out there, start writing the books, they're telling the history, um, which uh, I actually, this wasn't planned, but represent, uh, excuse me, Senator Weber, um, she just wrote a book. So look up her book. I forget the title to it, but um, if you're still on here, Representative or Senator Weber, excuse me for doing that. Um, uh, tell us the name of your book and where we can get it. But I think you can Google her on Amazon and she's the author, S-U-S-A-N-W-E-B-B-E-R. Um, so we are starting to tell our own stories on larger scales. And I think that's a part of like building is telling for us to tell the stories and for white folks to listen to our stories and to hear our stories and to not be so quick to dismiss us as a drunken Indian or a noble savage or you know what have you. Um, and not all of us powwow, not all of us uh, sing Indian, not all of us talk our language, not all of us live on our reservations. None of us have free college um, unless we've earned it through a scholarship or something. None of us have free um, full quality and high quality healthcare. Um, you know, um, we don't get an education for free. I mean, there's, we pay taxes just like everybody else. So those are the, some of the myths that I always hear. Is like, I mean, literally you guys, people think that uh, like in this day and age. Um, and so it's some of those myths that we need to break up. And I think just agree with what Deshane said, like we're not gonna change this overnight. It's a matter of uh, creating relationships um, across barriers 
to build a community where we all embrace each other. We see each other for who we are. I had a white guy tell me, well, I don't even see color. I don't see, you know, the color. And I'm like, no, no, please see my color. Don't see me as your, as your counterpart or as a white woman, see the black people, see the brown people, see the color and the diversity and embrace it. And I think, you know, that also goes to a uh, two spirit folks too. Let's see each other. Let's, let's embrace each other and let's accept each other and move forward together instead of trying to tear each other down or judge each other or make you um, agree with me or make me agree with you. It's not about coming to terms and, or it's not about like agreeing with each other. It's about understanding each other and coming together in a good way and in a way to where we find that common ground. We don't have to agree on everything, um, but as long as we are, are together um, on the common issues for the bare bones and the basic necessities of the common good of the people. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And uh, our last question is the short, what inspires you to vote? Mm. It's easy for me. Shane, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, what inspires me is the fact that, you know, I have a nine-year-old native son who is going to inherit whatever policies and systems, you know, my generation leaves in place. And I want him to have the best and I want his kids to have even better. Mm -hmm. And that sums it up for me. Uh, I, I am inspired to vote because of all I've learned. My ancestors, my, our ancestors have fought too damn hard for us not to vote. If you're not going to vote, what do we have to lose? If we're not going to decide, uh, even if we vote for the lesser of two evils, get out and vote. It doesn't matter. I vote so that we have clean water, so that my kids have clean air. My kids don't have to fight over clean water and my grandkids. That's what keeps me going is the future of Mother Earth and, and our children and grandchildren. Amazing. Thank you both so much. This was very wonderful. We're very honored to have your presentation and these great questions. Thank all the attendees and go forth and have a beautiful day. Enjoy the snow that is blanketing Montana at the moment and uh, be well and take care. Thank you all so much for tuning in and this recording will be available on the museum's website by the end of the week so if you want to share it with anybody out there please do so uh, we will be sending you the link to everyone that signed up for this uh, webinar by the end of the week so share vote together we are strong yes and thank you for doing this uh, to the museum and the historical uh museum. I can't see what all of it is. <laughs> thank you for all of what you're doing. And thank you to everybody out there doing what you're doing to uh, make sure our voices are heard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye.